Let us pray. <clears throat> oh God, visit us with thy truth from thy word and come alive in our hearts that we may live as children of the light. Amen. There is a story in the October 25th edition of the New York Review of Books about Tolstoy and Chekhov taking a walk together. The story is in a review of yet another review of the paintings of Caravaggio. Chekhov and Tolstoy were walking on a moist spring morning and they came across a horse and Tolstoy began describing what was going on in the horse's feelings and mind. He described the horse noticed the herbaceous trees, the moist smell of growth, the recent rain, the earth, and Chekhov interrupted Tolstoy and said, well, you must have been a horse in a previous life. <laughs> oh no, said Tolstoy. When I came across my own inside, I came across everybody's inside. Thessalonians is a letter that Paul or Silas or Timothy one of the three, or all three, wrote from Corinth about the year 50 or 51 to the church that they had established in Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a very interesting metropolis. It was the major city in the eastern Mediterranean. It was on a thermal gulf. It had been uh, founded near these hot springs where people like to refresh themselves. And it was on the main Roman military highway between Rome and the east. There were arched gates, some of which we have examined at the eastern and the western portals of the city. The city of Thessalonica was established around the year 315 by Alexander the Great's brother-in-law, who married the daughter of Philip of Macedon, uh, who uh, had a sister and her name was Thessalonia. And this charming fellow named the city after his wife. The Romans made Thessalonica the capital of Macedonia in 146 BC. And Thessalonica as a city, as a people, as a community, was made up of Gentiles and expatriate Jews and all kinds of people from the Eastern and Central Mediterranean. Thessalonica as a community supported Octavius and Antony versus against Brutus and Cassius at Philippi in 42 BC. And thus, it became a city, a free city, with its own government 
And by the time of Paul, in 44 AD, just dozens of years after our Lord was crucified, visited. Thessalonica had a very active religious life. Dionysius was the main event and the dying and resurrected God. Uh, Romans later accused the Christians of copying Dionysus with their worship of uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Of course, uh, there is no similarity because Dionysus uh, devotees practice ecstatic uh, or, or symbolic rites of a sexual nature. And no Christian would ever do that. Uh, Orpheus was a reformed uh, version of the Dionysian uh, uh, religion. And they, they worshiped God in terms of their God and Orpheus in terms of phallic symbols and orgies. And by the time Paul arrived with Silvanus and Timothy, Silvanus is the same as Silas in uh, uh, the Acts and Timothy. Uh, by the time they arrived, um, they were practicing emperor worship. So all this uh, is going on. When Paul arrived there, sometime between 44 and 49 AD, with his friends, there was a Jewish synagogue, and there were very active uh, Jews, and uh, they, uh, uh, the triumvirate established or tried to establish the Christian church in the Jewish synagogue. More than anywhere else in the New Testament, Paul uses the, the plural, we, 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 we. Uh, there is no I, Paul in this very early letter. And all three of them worked for a living. They worked in the daytime. Paul's specialty was making and weaving tent cloth that he sold in the marketplace. Uh, and we don't know what the other two did. The Jews were won over, and those that were won over weren't won, won, won over to Paul and Silvanus and Timothy's message, or were hostile, and uh, they uh, persecuted the new Christians. The three moved on to Corinth, and uh, as they were working to establish the church in the major, major city of Corinth, they got word that there was trouble in the church in Thessalonica. Uh, there's always trouble when people gather together from idle gossip to out and out persecution. They, Paul and Silvanus sent Timothy to investigate, and Timothy returns with good news to Corinth. Uh, they've uh, settled their differences and uh, this uh, was the occasion for this letter, 50 or 51 AD. First Thessalonians is written from Corinth by probably Silvanus. Timothy, by the way, makes his appearance on the stage here, and he was the most trusted of Paul's colleagues, uh, in addition to Barnabas. Anyway, 
Timothy reported that the persecution of the community by hostile Jews and by Dionysian and Orpheus and emperor worship was continuing. But the, the um, uh, uh, controversies within the community had been straightened out. Now, the issue, the issue that uh, uh, separated the local community from each other, in addition to the regular gossip and idle chatter that takes place in every community, uh, we all participate in that, um, the issue was uh, some of us had died. Uh, some uh, local Christians had died. And what about them? Were they included in the promise of Jesus? Everybody expected the parousia soon. Everybody expected Jesus to return soon. And the community was in trouble over the fact that Uncle Ezra had died and he had become a Christian. What about him when the Lord comes back? Uh, the first three chapters of the Epistle of Thessalonians our thanksgiving. Sylvanus writes on behalf of the other two that we uh, are grateful for the witness in Thessalonica and thank you for uh, our, our uh, uh, time there and the hospitality that you showed us. Uh, but you shouldn't be uh, alienated by uh, the concern uh, uh, about Uncle Ezra, who is, I made up the name, but, uh, who had died. Several of the leading members of the community had died. And Paul and Sylvanus cites Jesus' words of comfort. The dead in Christ will rise and will share the blessing of the living faithful. They go on to say, in response to trouble in the community in Thessalonica, no one knows the hour or the day or the time when Jesus will return. But you already have the presence of the Savior, through the Holy Spirit and through God's word spoken through his Son, who even now sitteth on the right hand of God. So you are children of light, so live in the day. Don't live at night when other religions are celebrating their uh, ex, ex, ecstasis uh, uh, symbol rites. Uh, watch and be sober. The hope of salvation is ever present and you are to live as children of light. And there follows a list of comfortable words. Comfort one another. Edify one another. Support one another. Don't gossip about one another. If you have 
something against someone, go to that person and work it out. Because you are children of light. Beware of idlers. Beware of idle gossip. Never return evil for evil. Always follow that which is good among yourselves and all people. And rejoice evermore and in everything give thanks. No. These are comfortable words, but Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy actually experienced these words. And those people who were empowered by the Holy Spirit to live as children of light were uh, empowered by these words and empowered by the Spirit to live these words. I don't need to tell you that we are a sinful people and we, we love to gossip about each other and we love to tell stories and I personally at my age like to be an I like to be an idler. I, I would, would rather be an idler than uh, anything I can think of about two hours a day. But uh, uh, that's why at 85 I'm still trying to preach uh, because I don't uh, think uh, that I'm any good unless I proclaim the gospel. And proclaiming the gospel is something I've been doing uh, more or less adequately uh, uh, since uh, I was uh, 27 years old and a Harvard brat. Do you remember the last lines of Max Weber's powerful book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. The last lines of that book, if you substitute religion, for the word capitalism, you get at what I'm trying to say and what Thessalonians says. The last lines are these. The spirit of capitalism was meant to be worn by humankind as a sort of a wings so that man, it was written in 1902, so that man could sail and soar and reach new heights. But that spirit has since become an iron cage. So, religion. We are free. We are children of light. We're free to risk acting toward each other as if we believe the gospel. And the Holy Spirit guarantees that if we do that, if we do that, neither death nor life, nor principalities nor powers can separate us from the love in Christ Jesus. 
So, let us pray for that power. Too often, I speak only of the Christian faith. Too often, the Christian religion winds up being an iron cage, trapping adherents so that they condemn people who do this or do that, or don't believe this or don't believe that. That is a prison, and people who practice that kind of religion are prisoners. But the freedom of the gospel enables us freely to be who we are for each other. It wasn't just the horse or Tolstoy who came across his own inside. We have all come across our own inside. And what we forget is that we know everyone's inside. Because no matter what color or clothing or level of education, we are all equal. This past election has two excellent, excellent illustrations of that. The first one Billy Graham. Billy Graham endorsed one candidate, the Republican candidate. And my Christian century has a picture of Billy sitting there with Romney. And Billy is saying, is quoted as saying, I will do everything I can to help you because you represent biblical values. Biblical values are traceable to the words of Jesus in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these. You've done it. To me, says Jesus, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. And the second illustration that Thessalonians is trying to teach us is Carl Rove. Carl Rove publicly demonstrated that he was among those aging white males who don't get it. They're not in charge anymore. We are, I'm an aging white man. We aren't in charge anymore. And that's a blessed thing for this country. It takes a risk to let someone else be in charge or be share the power. It takes a risk. That's what the gospel is. It enables us to risk love. Loving, loving. Thanks be to God. 
for his mercy. And I would have said the same thing if the other party had uh, 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 produced the, uh, those two examples. And there are many examples. But religion becomes an iron cage when you start pointing fingers at others. Oh, she is uh, not a Christian because no Christian would do that. How do you know? You don't. So let's keep the conversation going and let's embrace each other as we come to the Lord's table, thanking God that even we can get in on his love. And I can get on, in on his love for you, and you can get in on his love for me. And that's the